Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Society for the Humanities annual invitational lecture. I'm Paul Fleming, the Taylor Femmer Director for the Society, and it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Kate Mann, for what is my favorite talk of the year. But first, a bit of housekeeping. There's a chat button in the upper right-hand side of your screen. You can ask questions and post comments throughout the talk. After the talk, I will lead a discussion with Kate uh, drawn from the chat that you provide. The Society's Invitational Lecture is special because we see our colleagues every day, serve on committees with them, discuss teaching and exam schedules in the non-COVID times, have coffee or lunch together. But rarely, far too rarely, do we get to hear in depth and learn from their latest research and ideas. Our Invitational Lecture addresses this and offers the best of Cornell faculty to a wider audience. And there's no one I'd rather listen to and learn from than Kate Mann, Associate Professor of Philosophy and field member in Feminism, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Kate received her PhD in Philosophy from MIT and then was a junior fellow at Harvard's prestigious Society of Fellows. She works in the areas of moral philosophy, social philosophy, and feminist philosophy, and has published widely in academic journals on melancholy whiteness, the relationship between moral imperatives and bodily imperatives, humanism, and this is a great topic, disagreeing about how to disagree, which is even more complicated than it sounds, and about manipulation in a non-Machiavellian manner. Many more topics as well. And then, of course, there are her two big breathtaking books, breathtaking both in the sense of masterfully argued and in the sense of getting the wind knocked out of you. Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny from 2018, and entitled How Male Privilege Hurts Women, 2020. These studies have rightfully earned Kate's reputation as the philosopher of Me Too. I had the pleasure of working with Kate for a year at the Society for the Humanities in 2018-19, where she was a research fellow working on Entitled. She possesses an analytic mind of great precision and care, but what is unique about Kate is her sharpness and clarity that allows the most complex of theoretical insights, and she is, after all, a philosopher, to be available to and understandable by wider audiences, to any audience that cares to listen, reflect on, and engage with society's problems. And Kate brings her thought to these wider audiences. She writes regularly for the Washington Post, Politico, the New York Times, CNN, Times Literary Supplement, Newsweek, and Huffington Post. As one reviewer writes, what sets Kate's prose apart, and she's an exceptional stylist, is her, quote, refusal to ingratiate herself by softening the edges of her resolve, end of quote. Kate, in short, does not cut corners, neither with her arguments nor with her prose. And entitled is a detailed examination of how men, and in the US, especially white heterosexual men, benefit from spoken and unspoken entitlements to consent, to admiration, to sex, to medical care, bodily control, domestic labor, knowledge, and power. And these privileges, largely unacknowledged and unrecognized for what they are, come with a steep price. A systematic apparatus of misogynies that women pay, LGBTQ communities pay, and people of color pay. Privilege is not just a leg up, it is also the leg on the back of someone else. And what Kate shows with great insight, privilege is not just taking and hoarding spoils, but much more deviously, privilege is an entire moral framework. It is a set of values, a culture, and when women, and I would add minorities, rebel not only against the misalignment of privileges, but especially against their underlying moral order that the trouble begins. Kate is a public intellectual at a time when we desperately need it. And what is rare, she's a public philosopher. And I want to emphasize this and why it matters. We know or can know or can imagine the privileges that men enjoy. We can see it in the statistics about average pay average hours per week spent on domestic labor, the medical treatment of women, especially women of color, and the horrifying numbers in rape and sexual assault. But we need public philosophers like Kate to help us grasp not just the dire numbers, but the moral universe built around privilege as its justification and foundation. This is the deeper, the more subtle, 
and perhaps more intractable issue behind misogyny. The entire edifice of ideas and beliefs that form a system, which only a philosopher and a humanist like Kate can help shed light on. So without further ado, Professor Kate Mann, he said, she listened, mansplaining, gaslighting, and epistemic enlightenment. Entitlement. Well, thank you so much to Paul for that incredibly humbling and just wonderful introduction. And I should say, I'm just so grateful to be here. It's such an honor to be giving this annual invitational lecture for the Society for the Humanities at Cornell, where I spent such a happy, stimulating and enriching year with Paul, Kina, Emily and Paula and my colleagues um, for our uh, focal theme of authority that year, which I've often characterized as my obsession, my intellectual obsession is with authority. Um, so thank you, and thank you to all the audience members for being here. Okay. On February 9th, 2019, The Guardian tweeted out an article called Me and My Vulva, A Hundred Women Reveal All. The article featured an intimate photo series by Laura Dodsworth, which was intended to destigmatize and educate people about the vulvas of women, both cis and trans, as well as gender non-conforming people with the relevant body type. Shortly thereafter, a man saw fit to weigh in on the article's title. The correct word is vagina, opined one Dr. Paul Dolan on Twitter. The corrections came swiftly and in no short supply. The vulva is, of course, the correct terminology for the external anatomy picture. The vagina being an internal organ leading to the uterus, comparatively difficult to photograph. The corrections also came from authoritative sources. Gynecologists, for example. Even dictionary.com got involved with a tweet that read, well, actually, and a link to the word vulva's online definition. Paul Bullen was not deterred, however. In a truly remarkable feat of doubling down, he maintained that his usage was in fact the correct one. He added in a since deleted tweet, I consider the recent attempt to replace vagina with vulva as an affectation. In response to the inevitable and apt point that this was an especially egregious case of mansplaining, Bullen was similarly recalcitrant. That's an incorrect use of the word mansplaining, he chimed in. Not that I want to legitimize the term, but by its own definition, it requires more than just having a man who is explaining something, even if some in the audience are women. Bullen was quite correct about a speech act needing to meet further conditions beyond being a man explaining something to an audience which includes women in order to count as mansplaining. But his own speech act did meet the further relevant conditions. So a paradigmatic act of mansplaining consists in a man presuming to explain something incorrectly to a more expert female speaker or set of speakers, and in an overly confident, arrogant, or overbearing manner, which often results in his not backing down or admitting to his mistake, even if it has been authoritatively pointed out to him. Now, we can argue about whether an action that deviates somewhat from this paradigm still counts as mansplaining. As with the concepts expressed by most terms in natural language, its extension can be fuzzy and shift over time. But Paul Bullen's act was a paradigm case. There was no room for the kind of after-the-fact quibbling that cemented its status. I think there's room for a debate about what counts as mansplaining precisely, by which I'd be tempted to understand this as a question about how what we understand the term in question, how would it most productively, fruitfully be defined and understood. But I'll be more interested in this talk in the kind of attitude that mansplaining typically stems from and manifests. And my answer in short is entitlement. Entitlement of the epistemic variety specifically, which relates to knowledge, beliefs, and the possession of information. And here, turning to the slides, I believe mansplaining typically stems from an illicit, wrong-headed sense of entitlement on the part of the mansplainer 
to occupy the conversational position of the knower by default. That is to be the one who dispenses information, offers corrections, and authoritatively issues explanations. This is illicit partly when and because he is not so entitled. Others, namely women, happen to know more than he does, and he ought to anticipate this possibility rather than assuming his own epistemic superiority from the get-go. Dr. Paul Bullen ought to have anticipated, for example, that the woman who produced the photo series and was subsequently interviewed for an article entitled Me and My Vulva, Laura Judsworth, would have known the correct terminology with which to refer to her own subject matter, not to mention her own anatomy. So in this talk, I want to explore the notion of epistemic entitlement that I've just briefly introduced, and I want to connect it not only to the phenomenon of mansplaining, but the in many ways darker phenomenon of gaslighting. Before I uh, do that, however, I just want to note that this was hardly the first time a man had tried to correct a woman about a body part which she possessed, whereas he did not, on Twitter. In October 2016, after the release of hot, hot mic footage of Donald Trump boasting about grabbing women by the pussy, a male user named Dave Bazone mistook the fact that the vagina is indeed an internal organ for the impossibility of being sexually assaulted by being forcibly touched or grabbed in that area. He tweeted to political commentator Kirsten Powers, who had reported on this story, not only I give you a pass, not this time, the vagina is internal. Check an anatomy book. It cannot be grabbed. Hashtag Margaret. Kirsten Powers tweeted back, I know where my vagina is. Again, Powers' obvious epistemic authority on this point made it a paradigm case of mansplaining. Okay, so I want now to connect the notion that I've introduced of epistemic entitlement with a more familiar notion in the philosophical literature, which is due to Miranda Fricker, among others, of epistemic and particularly testimonial injustice. So I'm going to say a little bit about the relationship between these notions. Um, so for those who uh, are new to the epistemic injustice literature, Miranda Fricker has this idea of testimonial injustice where a speaker's word is taken to be less credible than it ought to be taken due to prejudices against members of her social group in the relevant domain of knowledge. So to give you a concrete example that Fricker uses here, um, think of the character of Marge Sherwood in The Talented Mr. Ripley. Now Marge suspects on the basis of uh, adequate justification that her fiance, Dickie Greenlee, has been murdered by his best friend, Tom Ripley, the talented Mr. Ripley. Now, on the basis of these warranted suspicions, she brings her concerns to her uh, future father-in-law, Herbert Greenlee, and says, I think your son has been done a mischief by Mr. Ripley. Uh, she is dismissed, however, by her would-be father-in-law on the following basis. He says, Marge, there's feminine intuition, and then there's facts. So he thereby dismisses her apt claim to knowledge, or at least justified beliefs, about what has happened to Dickie Greenlee on the basis of sexist stereotypes, invoking in particular the idea that women are uh, intuitive, but also hysterical, irrational, and prone to unwarranted suspicion. Okay, so that is the basic idea of a testimonial injustice as Fricker defines the term. So notice that whereas this kind of epistemic injustice involves unfairly dismissing a less privileged speaker, typically after she's attempted to make a contribution, epistemic entitlement involves peremptorily assuming greater authority to speak on the part of a more privileged speaker. And understood in this way, we can see that epistemic entitlement will often lead to testimonial injustice. But the former notion is temporarily prior to, and will sometimes in fact serve to cause and explain the latter. Here's another important distinction that I think is worth getting on the table. 
Whereas a testimonial injustice, such as the one that Herbert Greenleaf does to Marge, is about an agent not meeting her, um, their epistemic obligations to listen to others. Epistemic entitlement is about an agent's illicitly and overly entitled attitudes and behavior. In other words, they're assuming too much about another's obligation to listen to them. Okay. So I also want to connect this notion of epistemic entitlement to Christy Dodson's important notion of testimonial, sm testimonial smother. Um, so it's worth noticing that manifestations of epistemic entitlement can also result in a less privileged speaker deciding to not make her intended or fitting contribution to the conversation whatsoever. She may in effect be coerced into self-silencing because of her awareness of this epistemic entitlement in her interlocutor that renders him unable to hear her properly. And this will then constitute what the philosopher Christy Dodson calls testimonial smothering, where a speaker self-silences due to her anticipation that her word will not receive the proper uptake and that there is a kind of testimonial incompetence on the part of the hearer. Uh, so I put on the slides just briefly Dodson's definition of testimonial smothering for those of you who are interested, contains quite a lot of moving parts. Um, but just to um, give you the basic gist of why uh, testimonial uh, smothering uh, will often be at stake here, um, it's worth noting that sometimes the speaker will self-silence because the specific content of her testimony makes it unsafe or risky for a speaker like her to make that contribution. Or she may self-silence because it's unsafe or risky for a speaker like her to venture to say anything at all in the atmosphere of epistemic entitlement, which she is entering into. Um, she may self-silence because it's unsafe or risky for a speaker like her to interrupt the relentless flow of a man's pontificating. A mansplainer, that's to say, may be nigh on uninterruptible. So I think this point is epitomized by an incident recounted by Rebecca Solnit in her classic and galvanizing essay, Men Explain Things to Me. By the way, Solnit did not herself coined the term mansplaining, and it in fact reports a degree of ambivalence about it. But her 2008 essay nevertheless inspired the coinage and much of the subsequent discourse. So here's what happened. Solnit had attended a dinner party with a female friend and was prevailed upon by the older, distinguished male host to linger after dinner to talk about Solnit's writing. I hear you've written a couple of books, he offered genially. Several, actually, ventured Solnit. And what are they about? Asked this man in a patronizing tone in, quote, much the way you encourage your friend seven-year-old to describe flute practice, as Solnit puts it. Uh, Solnit nevertheless obliged, beginning to describe her most recent book at the time, which was about Edward Gretsch an English-American photographer and pioneer of motion pictures. Solnit didn't get far, however. She recalls, he cut me off soon after I mentioned Moybridge. And have you heard about the very important Moybridge book that came out this year? So caught up was I in my assigned role as ingenue that I was perfectly willing to entertain the possibility that another book on the same subject had come out simultaneously and I'd somehow missed it. He was already telling me about this very important book with that smug look I know so well in a man holding forth, eyes fixed on the fuzzy far horizon of his own authority. But the very important book Solnit's friend soon realized was Solnit's. The friend tried to interject to point this out three or four times, but the mansplainer failed somehow to hear her. When he finally registered this news, his face fell. He turned ashen. Selmet writes that I was indeed the author of the very important book it turned out he hadn't read, just read about in the New York Times book review a few months earlier, so confused the neat categories 
into which his world was sorted, that he was stunned speechless for a moment before he began holding forth again. Of the many insights Solnit offers us here into the nature of mansplaining, one of the most striking is the way both speakers are assigned roles in the exchange, which are then difficult to break from. Solnit's host was the authority, of course, and she was cast as the ingenue, the naive one, quote, an empty vessel to be filled with his wisdom and knowledge in some sort of obscure impregnation metaphor, end quote. Because of the social dynamics in play here, it then became very difficult to change the course of the conversation. Even so, that female friends' powers of intervention were strictly limited. And without such an active bystander, one wonders whether the correction would have been issued whatsoever. In part, it would depend on whether Selnit had the confidence to insist that the book was indeed her own, which, as she points out, as a distinguished and prolific author, not to mention a white woman, she was in a comparatively good position to muster. It still wouldn't have been easy for many people, uh, me included. And at least as importantly, it would also have depended upon Solnit being willing to do something socially jarring, liable to be perceived as rude in asserting herself in this manner. Of course, she would have been completely within her rights, entirely entitled to do so. But the skewed sense of epistemic entitlement which fed into the exchange left her host face ash in the coal when he finally registered his error. She was in danger of humiliating him. And still, he was only momentarily deterred. He proceeded to explain other things when unceremoniously deprived of that fledgling site of epistemic domination. It's crucial to see that such social roles always intersect with others. So when we talk about Solnit's reminder to women that comes from mansplaining that the truth is not our property now or ever, that applies all the more so to black women in the US as well as other women of color. Um, as uh, the brilliant sociologist and writer Tracy McMillan Cotton writes, a professional smart person can be so without ever reading a black woman, ever interviewing a black woman, ever following a black woman, or ever thinking about a black woman's existence. And in the essay in which she's writing about this girl six, uh, McMillan Cotton uh, just goes and examines how many black women Jonathan Chait and David Brooks follow on Twitter. And it turns out the answer is six apiece out of three or 400 people they follow. So that's really telling. Um, so black women are not just dismissed then, they are not heeded in the first place by those endowed with this kind of epistemic privilege. Okay, so I want to think now about some of the empirical evidence because the idea that mansplaining is a prevalent phenomenon is, of course, an empirical hypothesis, albeit one which rings true to many women whose experiences shouldn't be discounted or dismissed at the risk of perpetrating the same kind of testimonial injustice which mansplaining often leads to. So I think we can confidently say, indeed, we've observed that a man will sometimes arrogantly explain things to a woman who is more expert than he is. On the other hand, an experience is just that, singular, and it can neither establish the pervasiveness of some phenomenon nor its uniquely gendered character. So it remains possible, uh, for all I've said, that women are equally likely to arrogantly explain things to men, in theory. While more empirical evidence on mansplaining uh, per se can and must be gathered, there's an abundance of research that makes the mansplaining hypothesis eminently plausible on the basis of observing gender dynamics at play with other behaviors that are closely related. Taking the flaw and interrupting someone are cases in point, both intuitively and because they can be explained in part by a sense of entitlement to be the knower, the authority, and the one who issues explanations. This sense of epistemic entitlement, as I've defined it, makes it very natural to interject, to speak over others, and to hold the floor for longer than other people. 
So here's a smattering of that relevant research, uh, focusing on settings where the female speaker's authority or expertise is important, salient, and typically presumed or at least presumable. In such contexts, we find that men are prone to talk more than women. So a classic 2012 study by Victoria Briscoe, the Yale researcher, showed using, using both uh, naturalistic and experimental methods that powerful male senators talked more than their female counterparts. Similarly, a slightly older study of Harvard Law students found that men were 50% more likely to offer at least one comment in class and nearly 150% more likely to volunteer to speak three times or more. The study's author, Adam Moyfield, commented, a small number of students accounted for much of the classroom participation, and these top talkers were overwhelmingly male. Okay. Another point is that women are more prone to be interrupted. A 2017 study showed that female engineering job candidates were interrupted significantly more than their male colleagues, which the authors said made it harder for them to bring their job talks to a compelling conclusion because they were being interrupted so much. Similarly, another 2017 study out of Northwestern of Supreme Court oral argument transcripts showed that as of 2015, uh, despite there being just three female Supreme Court justices, they attracted over 65% of the total interruptions. Uh, final point, uh, men seem especially prone to be the interrupters of women. So the authors of the above study, Tom Jacobi and Dylan Schweers, commented that furthermore, as more women join the court, the reactions of the male justices has been to increase their interruptions of the female justices. Many male justices are now interrupting female justices at double digit rates per term, but the reverse is almost never true. In the last 12 years, during which women made up on average uh, just under a quarter of the bench, um, just under a third of interruptions were of the female justices, but only 4% were by the female justices. So overall, they found that judicial interactions at oral argument are highly gendered, with women being interrupted at disproportionate rates by their male colleagues, as well as male advocates. So this was comparing how often men interrupted men, how often women interrupted men, how often women interrupted women, and how often, finally, men interrupted women. It was that last one that attracted disproportionate interruptions. Um, by the way, in putting it in these terms, I of course don't mean to erase non-binary folks, but here we're examining um, the Supreme Court where we did have uh, just men and women uh, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. So I want to turn now from uh, mansplaining to a different manifestation and I think a darker manifestation of epistemic entitlement, namely gaslighting. So as we've seen, epistemic entitlement can be maintained politely with a sense of utmost if unearned confidence. But it can also be jealously guarded and defended, sometimes to the point of engaging in creepy, controlling, and even abusive behavior. One of these uh, dark manifestations, case in point, uh, is gaslighting. Gaslighting takes its name from the 1938 Patrick Hamilton play, Angel Street, which was performed on stage as Gaslight. The play was subsequently made into two films by the latter name, both the UK and American version, and the movies have become better known than the original play. But the play is, to my mind, richer than either film, and so is going to form the basis for the discussion here. In Gaslight, as I'll refer to it, Mr. Manningham appears to be intent on sending his wife, Bella, insane. His original motives for doing so only become apparent during the play's second act. But importantly, his behavior is intelligible right from the beginning, lending the play its claustrophobic, indeed suffocating atmosphere. Act one is a vivid depiction of domestic terror. Mr. Manningham wrong foots and undermines his wife at every turn, humiliating her in front of their servants.
Mr. Manningham asks, why are you so apprehensive, Bella? I was not about to reproach you. Bella Manningham responds nervously, no, dear, I know you weren't. And her husband goes on to berate uh, her shortly thereafter, uh, which begins to raise suspicions in the audience that she's not allowed to identify what's actually going on in her own household, her own relationship. Um, she's not allowed to identify the dynamics uh, that uh, she is inhabiting. In a particularly cruel and long-running series of manipulations, um, Mr. Manningham has led his wife, Bella, to believe that she is going out of her mind and losing possession of her rational faculties by regularly hiding their possessions and then holding her responsible for their disappearance. He also accuses her, um, oh, and he also holds her responsible, not merely causally, but morally, depicting her as mischievous and wicked, as well as confused and delusional. He also accuses her most painfully of all of deliberately hurting their pet dog, thus painting her as the cruel and abusive one. This combination of accusations is of course incoherent, as Bella Manningham tries repeatedly to point out to her husband. If she really is confused and delusional and cannot help her behavior, then surely he ought to treat her kindly and try to get her help rather than getting angry. But Mr. Manningham ignores this as he does with all of his wife's attempt to prevail upon his goodwill. She is truly powerless within their household. And she's nobody outside of it since her husband has deliberately isolated her from all of her friends and relatives. She has no choice but to defer to him and even then it does little to appease the seething temper. It's worth noting, by the way, that he never lifts a finger in violence against her. And this observation echoes Carmen Maria Machado's um, uh, point that the majority of de domestic abuse is perfectly legal, which is a kind of haunting uh, point, I think. So the effect of Mr. Manningham's behavior, a devastating portrait of a recognizable pattern of abuse, which subsequently became known as gaslighting, for reasons I'll get to in a moment, is to deprive Bella of her own sense of epistemic entitlement to state even the most basic realities. Toward the end of act one in an arguably disappointing deus ex machina, a detective comes to visit her and tells her the terrible, albeit liberating truth. Her husband is in fact the diabolical Sydney Power who murdered the former resident of their house, Alice Barlow, in order to steal Barlow's valuable rubies. He slit Alice Barlow's throat to silence her some 15 years prior. But he may, may never have managed to locate the rubies in the house, Detective Ruff suspects and confides in Bella. Might he still be looking for the jewels on the top floor of their home? which is shut up off limits to her and even the servants, he might indeed, Bella realizes. Bella Manningham says to this detective, it all sounds so incredible, but when I'm alone at night, I get the idea that somebody's walking about up there, up there at night when my husband's out and hear noises from my bedroom, but I'm too afraid to go up. The detective asks, have you told your husband about this? No, I'm afraid to. He gets angry. He says, I imagine things which don't exist. It never struck you, did it, that it might be your own husband walking about up there? Bella replies, yes, that is what I thought, but I thought I must be mad. Tell me how you know. Why not tell me first how you knew Mrs. Manningham? And Bella replies, it's true then, it's true. I knew it, I knew it. Bella Manningham did indeed know deep down that her husband was creeping about upstairs. For as she goes on to explain, 10 minutes after he left the house every evening, the gaslight would ebb. And 10 minutes before he came back, it would return to its former full flame. That meant another light had then turned off and then uh, turned on and then off again somewhere in the house because the way these lights worked is that the glow of each light would diminish as another gas lamp siphoned gas pressure away from it. 
But Mel Bella Manningham was forced to deny and could barely admit to herself what she knew. Her husband's epistemic domination over her was so total that she didn't dare to question his movements, let alone his motives. And his sense of epistemic entitlement, his sense of entitlement to maintain that kind of domination was so great that she was the one who felt guilty for entertaining even the slightest doubts about her scurrilous, lying husband. In Act One, she ventures hopefully, oh, Jack, dear, you've been so much kinder lately. Is it possible you're beginning to see my point of view? I don't know that I ever differed from it, did I, Bella? Oh, Jack, dear, it's true, it's true. You can see that repetition or anticipation of those words, it's true, it's true. But here they ring so hollow, because in fact, as I'm going to suggest in a moment, one of the key things gaslighting does, or at least aims at, is to reduce the acceptability or viability of multiple perspectives. It says, in effect, that the victim of gaslighting has to buy into the gaslighter's perspective or point of view. In the context of the action as a whole, too, it's clear that in this case, Bella is not allowed to question her husband's kindness, that in itself being a particular cruelty. Okay. So I think we see that gaslighting can thus have a distinctively moral as well as rational dimension via a variety of techniques of which more shortly the victim may effectively be morally prohibited from disputing the gaslighter's epistemic authority, and with it, his version of reality, his narrative, or his side of the story. She would be committing a grievous sin within the context of the relationship by questioning him, challenging him, or disagreeing with him regarding certain matters, which might be more or less extensive or alternatively domain-specific. So it might be a whole kind of reality that's being fabricated um, for the victim, or it might be on smaller matters where she's not allowed to issue a challenge. Um, as the philosopher Kate Abramson argues in her groundbreaking work on gaslighting, what makes the difference between the fellow who ignores or dismisses evidence and the one who gaslights is the inability to tolerate even the possibility of challenge. So, of course, what I've given you by way of a paradigm of gaslighting is a fictional case. So I think it's worth just spending a few minutes on a real life case. Um, and I think we'll begin to see some patterns as well by looking at these two cases side by side. So a real life case scarcely less extreme than the uh, example from the play helps to underscore this point about the moral dimension of gaslighting. On the hit podcast, Dirty John, Deborah Newell, a woman in her late 50s, falls in love with and marries a con artist named John. He pretended to be an anesthesiologist, dressing up in scrubs on the dates, while in reality he was a nurse anesthetist who had been fired and suspended for stealing drugs intended for patients some of whom were on the operating table at the time, and thus would have been left in agony. He had a long history of addiction to prescription pain medication, and he had stalked and blackmailed many women. He had boasted of raping one of them. He'd been repeatedly arrested, served with restraining orders, and when he met Deborah, unbeknownst to her, he had just gotten out of prison for felony drug theft. Just the most devious, dangerous, deceptive person was how one hardened career cop described John Meehan, hence the eponymous moniker. Some, as well as calling him Dirty John, also called him Filthy. So Deborah's children had strong suspicions and worried about their mother. Eventually, Deborah found incontrovertible evidence of his myriad deceptions arrest warrants, restraining orders, jail and prison records, and she moved out of their shared home in Newport Beach. Meanwhile, John was in hospital following back surgery and ensuing complications. When she withdrew from him, he began to threaten her and depicted her as the wrongdoer, 
accusing her of stealing from him, hitting him, all these completely spurious uh, accusations. And this was a go-to move for a dirty John throughout his life, painting himself as the victim on no basis whatsoever. Deborah hid out from John in hotels on the advice of a detective whose help she had appealed to. Here's what's interesting. So nonetheless, somehow in spite of all of this, Deborah not only forgave John, but was persuaded by him that it was all a big misunderstanding. She bought his demonstrable dangerous lies when she had the documented evidence that they were lies, um, even ha after having discovered this proof of his fabrications. So here is LA Times journalist Christopher Gofford interviewing Deborah about how he pulled this off. Um, okay, so 23 days go by while John's in hospital for this back surgery. And Deborah says, I just want to look him straight in the face and ask him why he did this. So I went in there and he said, those stories are wrong, that he was set up. He was trying to tell me so many times that he was set up and had to go to jail. Please forgive him. He just knew that I wouldn't understand until he had all the evidence in front of him. All a big misunderstanding. All a big misunderstanding. And he had an answer for everything. It was so convincing that I thought, okay, he literally had convinced me at this point that he is not this person, despite all of the paperwork. Yes, all of the facts were right there in front of me, and he is that convincing that I would say that when she trails off. It's also in love with him, so hard when you're in love to listen, you're listening to your heart, not your head. Did you ask him about his nickname, Dirty John? He said it wasn't true. He said, I don't know where you got that from. It was as if everything... He was able to convince me. He was so good at it. It could be a cold day out and he could convince me that it's 95 degrees. That's how good he was to where you questioned yourself. It's almost like he convinced you that all the facts about his life were some kind of hallucination on your part. Yes, he made me out to be the one. That he was this great guy and that everyone else had done him wrong is what he said. He always, again, he always had a story. He told me that he had lied because he thought he'd lose to me, but he feels so lucky that I'm such a forgiving person. And hell, I'm the love of his life. I've made him a better person, just all this kind of stuff. I felt guilty to some degree that I'd married him and that he's in hospital, but at the same time I feared. Explain that to me. Guilty why? Because I made a commitment. I made a commitment to marriage for better or worse. But notice that importantly, John never alleged that Deborah was crazy. So this is a very common both conception of gaslighting and characterization of gaslighting in the literature that's all about making a victim feel that she's insane for questioning someone. John did something different. He made Deborah out to be a bad person when she challenged or withdrew from him and a good person for believing him and believing in him. So his a close reading of these exchanges revealed that his epistemic fate for swallowing his story was moral. It was the prospect of badness or meanness, not madness or stupidity, that made Deborah unable to continue to think ill of John. And that is what allowed him to gaslight her so effectively. So upshot, making someone question their own rationality or think they're positively crazy is only one way to achieve the kind of epistemic domination which I'm arguing gaslighting typically aims at. Sometimes the gaslighter may manage to make his victim feel morally compromised and bad, shameful, guilty, disloyal, or insufficiently sympathetic in as much as she challenges his narrative. Um, and plying someone into epistemic submission by appealing to her moral capacities in this way can have much the same effect as making her doubt her rational capacities. But one reason why this really matters is that to put it bluntly, it's relatively hard to convince most of us that we're going crazy, that our senses are deceiving us. It's much, much easier, given the fallibility of moral judgment, to convince us that we're morally going wrong. So gaslighting someone on the basis of making her feel guilty is a much easier route to gaslighting. So this has quite big implications for how pervasive or at least feasible gaslighting may be. 
just to finish up here. Um, so the intended result of these techniques being that if she questions him, this will only strengthen the pre-existing case against her. That there's something fundamentally wrong with her, either rationally, she's crazy, delusional, paranoid, etc., or alternatively, as I've emphasized, morally, she's a heartless bitch, incapable of trust, cruelly unforgiving, etc. And the end result being much the same as well, creating an epistemic agent who will not, cannot challenge him. Gaslighting this results in a paradigm case in a victim who feels a false sense of moral and or rational obligation to believe his story over her own. She has been epistemically dominated, colonized even. And it's just to conclude one scene from the play Gaslight that has haunted me that I just wanted to leave you with. Mr. Manningham asked his wife, do you know what you remind me of, Bella, as you walk across the room? No, what do I remind you of? A somnambulist, Bella, a sleepwalker. Have you ever seen such a person? No, I have never seen one. Haven't you not that funny, glazed, dazed look of a wandering mind, the body that acts without the soul to guide it? I've often thought you had that look, but it's never been so strong as tonight. Bella Manningham replies, my mind is not wandering. And in a way, they are both right. Her mind is no longer her own. She has been hollowed out, excavated as an epistemic agent. But precisely because of that, her mind is no longer free to wander. It is under his control, his rule, his dominion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kate, for that wonderful lecture. And thank you all out there in the audience for your credible comments and questions on in the chat box. Um, so Kate, I, I, I'm gonna kind of aggregate some of these really interesting questions and comments, and hopefully we can discuss them a bit in the 15 minutes or so that we have here. And one of the first questions that came in, a lot of these are about gaslighting. Mm -hmm. And one of the first ones that came in was that this is a 1938 play and how striking it is, how topical that we can, it is so we can see it today. It, in other words, in that almost 80, 90 years, so little seems to have changed. And if you could, if you know a bit, could say a bit about the discourse around, you know, gaslighting, domestic abuse at that time, um, have things changed? Is this, is, are you, is, is the argument you're making that this is consistent over the century? Anything you wanna say about putting that in content and what may have changed particularly our ability to talk or address it? Yeah, thank you, Paul. That's it's such a good question. So, I mean, I think in many ways this play was incredibly prescient. Yeah. It kind of both coined a term for a recognizable dynamic, but it coined it well in advance of it being widely recognized as a problem. Mm -hmm. and the notion of domestic abuse just wasn't in, um, you know, it wasn't in common parlance until the 70s. And similarly, the notion of gaslighting really didn't uh, take off as uh, naming a form of domestic abuse or domestic terror until the 70s or 80s. Um, and even into the 90s, it was continuing to um, have more and more uptake. Um, I think part of what this points to, though, is the fact that a uh, perceptive playwright can pick up on a gender dynamic that is... Um, probably as old as time, and also one that we find uh, much more widespread than uh, just in the context of gendered social relations. So one of the things that I'm really interested in here is the way that thinking about domestic abuse, domestic violence, and gaslighting in particular can be seen as a model for other unhealthy, exploitative, or abusive relations that have much wider purchase in society. Mm -hmm. So thinking of what, say, Donald Trump did to his followers in particular as a form of gaslighting on the basis of taking the gendered case as a paradigm, but then understanding this dynamic to have far wider purchase, um, I think we can really get something out of treating gendered intrapersonal uh, ills like this as the basis for um, 
elaborating on abusive dynamics that can be taking place at a much wider scale. That's great. That leads into another question um, that I think is really interesting in the role of race in your in your your kind of examination of mansplaining and epistemic entitlement and the question you know that we have here is you know can white women be complicit in gaslighting and mansplaining to bipoc folks in other words you know in what way can this move beyond the question of gender to race and a little thoughts on that i think you set that up with your last answer but i'd love to hear more yeah totally i think that's that's not only possible but ubiquitous Mm -hmm. uh i think you know, it's, it's worth noting that anytime you have a kind of pre-existing hierarchical relation or um, a relation in which, um, in particular, the epistemic power is at stake, it's relatively easy to invoke some of these dynamics to make someone feel that um, they are either morally or rationally defective according to this more powerful person, such as a white woman talking down to BIPOC folks, Mm -hmm. um, it's relatively easy to invoke that in order to do um, the, uh, to kind of affect a gaslighting dynamic. Um, But I think it's also worth noting that as well as being something that invokes pre-existing hierarchies, of knowledge, I think it can also be one that goes into creating them. Mm-hmm. So in a way, how did, um, to go back to the example of Trump, which I think a lot of us are wrestling with how to understand not only the Trump era, but specific abusive tactics that he wielded so successfully. How did he create this loyal, incredibly loyal band of followers? Maybe not in spite of his lies and Uh, you know, he's incredibly brazen wise, but in a way precisely because of them. Um, I mean, he created this epistemic hierarchy by building a loyal following who felt guilty and disloyal for questioning him. Mm -hmm. So he created a gaslit nation, Trump nation being a gaslit nation. Ooh, that's that's a depressing thought, but I think that's that's right on. Um, there's uh, two related questions. I think I'll start with the second one because it might pick up up on that point. A couple of people have asked about kind of what is the long term prognosis for mansplainers once they've kind of been confronted, and is it possible to change behavior? And I'll add from my own notes, but I found striking about Rebecca Solna's anecdote is the last bit where mm-hmm. after he's been caught after he has the ashen face, that he continues on, that it just nothing changes. Um, and so I wonder if you have some information, studies about confronting mansplainers, the possibility of change, how that goes, how one does that. I mean, so I can already give you the second. The second question a lot of people want to know is what to do in this situation, yeah. both when one is being mansplained too, but also when one witnesses that. I mean, what are the types of strategies for confronting this? Um, and I'll leave it to you to, to go on that. Yeah, no, I love the question because it's tricky. It's mm. clear that calling out mansplaining um, often leads to a markedly bad reaction. It can even lead to a violent reaction. You know, I, I have this vivid memory of um, of telling a dear friend that he was mansplaining something to me, and he punched the wall, mm. which was an unprecedented gesture Mm. and one that really gave me prolonged pause. Um, You know, if I had a concrete and um, sort of pragmatic suggestion here, it would be to teach men, especially white men, that mansplaining is something that they will probably do should not view as a kind of character assassination that it, if it's pointed out that they're doing, that they've inculcated a lot of um, the norms that say that mansplaining is in fact appropriate behavior on their part and to almost take pride in being someone who can uh, sit up, take notice, back themselves up and say, oops, I think I just mansplained that to you. Um, let me stop and let me listen. Mm-hmm. 
And if those kind of moves can be made, it's, it's of a piece with a more general view I have about ethics that it's so important to be able to face uh, somewhat shameful things that we do and are and say and not let it sever the sight lines as shame can do between yourself and another interlocutor. But rather, you lift your head up, painful as it might be, try to make eye contact, apologize, and move on in a spirit of, I messed this up, but I want to do better, and I can admit my mistakes. And I think that that's totally possible. It's when it's kind of fragile identity is built upon that of not being a mansplainer or for that matter, a gaslighter, mm -hmm. that we get these really unhealthy dynamics that involve not being able to admit error. Um, you know, I'll add that I, this is disturbing, but here's one really good way of getting yourself into a position where you can be gaslit. Think that the person who you're an interlocutor with or in an intimate relationship with would never gaslight you. Oh, not him. How could you even think that about him? And that kind of inability to face the possibility of elements, uh, much less Machiavellian, much less mm -hmm. um, you know, dramatic than the Mr. Manningham or Dirty John examples, but to refuse the possibility of subtler and more insidious forms of gaslighting as well as mansplaining in everyday context i think actually gives them much more um much more scope to happen mm -hmm. um because yeah being convinced that this could never happen to you he's just such a good guy you can see how that sets up a situation yeah. where you feel guilty for even thinking that there might be something morally awry in a particular uh, dynamic that you have. Um, so yeah, and in terms of, um, you know, uh, yeah, maybe that's enough about uh, that set of questions. I don't think it's hopeless by any means, but I think it's difficult. Yeah. No, it's nice because it picks up a concern that's also been expressed in the chat that, that the onus should cannot only be on women, that this is also on, certainly on men and on society as a whole. I mean, it, the part of the systematic nature of this is to not just make it women confronting men about mansplaining, but men confronting other men, men confronting themselves and society as a whole. So I think that's really nice. I think one last question, which, which stays on the topic, but it's looking forward and it's, you know, it's a real heartfelt concern. How do we raise children to be, you know, not fall into these patterns of gaslighting, mansplaining. At the same time, you want them to be enthusiastic and engaged participants in conversations. You want them to be intellectually alive, but also good listeners. And this, I think, kind of gets to the systemic nature of what you're talking about, that it's beyond, it certainly is individuals, but it's also beyond individuals. So if you have any thoughts about how to raise children to avoid and to basically tampen down this tendency in society? Yeah, no, I think about this a lot, um, especially as a relatively new parent, because I think it's tricky. Um, you know, I one you don't want to um, tamp down enthusiasm and the sheer pleasure of knowledge and explaining what you know. But that's there's a reason mansplaining happens that isn't pernicious, which is that it's pleasurable to share knowledge with others. Um, it's not just useful, it's, it's also a kind of a deep um, human need, I think. And so one of the things that I think is useful here is to have these explicit concepts and conversations like mansplaining and gaslighting where, you know, in a way I concentrated on these rather extreme cases to illustrate the point, but in the kind of the longer version of this work, uh, I try to show that if you take these paradigms, you find out that the basic dynamic happens all over the place and is a perfectly everyday phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And again, that can reduce the shame in making missteps when it comes to mansplaining, white-splaining, cis-splaining, you know, all of these things that I think anyone in a position of relative epistemic privilege is probably inclined to do. And rather than trying to avoid that risk, um, 
entirely, I think sometimes what it's good to do is admit that you will make those mistakes mm -hmm. and to be very alert to the possibility of those mistakes and to correcting them on the fly rather than being fearful of ever making that misstep because it would be such a black mark against your character. Instead, I think we can think of it as something that probably even the best of us will do and that we should, it should be one of those ordinary mistakes that we aren't fragile about the possibility that we make um, on the regular with the aim of doing better. Great, I think with that, we can wrap it up for the evening. Um, I wanna thank Kate Mann for sharing your work and your research and thoughts with us. I wanna thank the audience for your really incredible uh, comments and questions. And thank you all for being here on a Friday afternoon, early evening. Everybody have a great dinner, great weekend, and hope to see you again for this type of talk. But again, thank you, Kate. Thank you so much, everyone, especially Paul.